Moments of parting, goodbye moments, are some of the most difficult ones for us, especially when we know that they are final partings, when we must say goodbye to our loved ones, when we part from those we hold dear. When we experience these things, we experience some of the most raw moments of human emotion. I think this truth is reflected in the words which we use at partings across many languages. In German, the formal farewell is Auf Wiedersehen, which is literally translated as until our next seeing. Marlene, the same is true uh, for one French parting, au revoir. Right, okay, good. The same is true of the Russian Das Vidanya, until the next meeting. This is also true of Mandarin, Zaijian, to see again. The Japanese has, have a little bit different way of dealing with this parting moment. In saying their parting word, sayonara, they say, if it is to be that way. All of these parting words or phrases seem to try to avoid the truth of the parting, that we will no longer see or be with one another. They try to avoid the challenge that we witness in partings, the challenge that we witness in our text today. Yet some languages or versions tap into the weight of the goodbye. For example, another French word for parting is adieu, which means I commend you to God, or simply to God. The same is true for adios in Spanish, to God. And the same is actually true for goodbye in English, a contraction from the early English, God be with you. These versions of farewell seem to be able to embrace the difficulty, the permanence of parting. Though they encapsulate the weight of departure and sometimes the pain of it, they also seem to acknowledge the truth of it. Forty days after the celebration of the resurrection, forty days into the Easter season, we celebrate the final milestone in the story of Christ's presence with his disciples. This is really the story of Christ saying goodbye to his disciples. The story of their final farewell and a moment of departure of God's embodied presence with God's people. Now, God's presence with the people is an important part of the entire story of faith. The Psalms speak this truth. Psalm 23 says, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Psalm 46 says, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Psalm 121 says, The Lord is your keeper, the Lord is your shade at your right hand. These psalms remind us that an important part of God's story, an important part of our lives, is the presence of God with us. It would be understandable then to approach this text with a certain amount of trepidation. The departure of God incarnate from the presence of God's people might be alarming. The absence of God is frightening. Indeed, this is one description of hell, being absent from God or having no relationship with God. It is especially concerning because since this is the resurrected Christ, the Christ that was lost to them once before, but who was raised from the dead, because of that fact, it's all the more alarming. Though Jesus' departure from this world after his resurrection only takes one half of a verse in the Gospel of Luke, it's an important moment. Throughout the broad scope of Scripture, the story that has been, this is a story that has been told time and time again. The story of relationship between God and God's children. In Genesis, God is active in creation. God walks with Adam and Eve 
in the Garden of Eden, engaging in relationship with them. After the exodus from Egypt, as the people wander in the wilderness, God was present with them by day in the pillar of cloud and present by night in the pillar of fire. Some of the first instructions given to the wanderers were how to construct a holy dwelling place where God could be present with the people, a place where people would have access to God. And after entering the promised land, when the line of kings was established, a top priority was the location of the Ark of the Covenant and the construction of a temple where God's presence would dwell in the land. The place where God's people could come to worship God and be near the presence of God. The most devastating part of the exile to Babylon was the destruction of that temple. The very destruction of the very connection between God and God's people. Finally, God became present with the people in the most tangible way possible by becoming incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ, living with the people, walking, talking, eating, and being with them. Even Christ's death, though, it created a momentary absence, was not able to keep God from being present with the people. Until, that is, we read this story. I had the wonderful blessing over two weeks in April and May to travel to the Holy Land as an alum of my seminary. Claire and I went for about 14 days with Claire's sister and our brother-in-law, two of our former professors, and about 18 other students and alums. We traveled in Jordan and Israel and Palestine, exploring sites of antiquity and wondering at these incredible places. As I was thinking about this trip, I realized it was really an investment in the future because it was basically a two-week journey of shameless sermon material collection, <laughs> which I'm sure you'll hear plenty about. Upon further reflection of this trip and a previous trip I took the, to the Holy Land, I have been thinking about why so many people, myself included, travel to this part of the world, especially with it being a particularly volatile region wrapped up in religious and political conflict. So often I hear people exclaim about the wonder of walking in the footsteps of Jesus, seeing the sights that Jesus saw, reflecting on the power of being separated from him only by time and not by space. I myself have felt the draw of this, standing at the garden tomb, imagining the women coming there early on Easter morning and finding no body, or standing on the banks of the Jordan River, imagining John baptizing Jesus, or sailing on the Sea of Galilee, imagining the waves and wind churning, and the ghostly figure of Jesus approaching the boat on the water. It's easy to get caught up in this pool. I think this draw, this pull, toward walking the footsteps of Jesus is related to the desire to experience God's presence. A desire to be where God has been, to touch what God has touched, to be present with God in a more full and real way. The difficult thing is, this is a trap. First of all, we don't really know exactly where most of these things happened. So while we can claim that tradition says this, or that tradition says that, we're making a lot of assumptions. Also, while being in those places can be meaningful, the truth of God's presence is that it is not tied up, trapped in, or confined to that particular place or that particular time. We know this because soon after the ascension, we celebrate Pentecost, the 50th day after Easter, next Sunday. Pentecost is the celebration of the birth of the church through the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, Christ's ascension does not mark a moment when God was no longer there. 
It marks the transition between Christ being God's tangible presence in the world and the Holy Spirit as God's presence. While Christ was in the world, before he died and after his resurrection, all eyes were on Christ. He traveled throughout Israel healing, teaching, and preaching a gospel of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. He was a charismatic figure. He gathered a multitude of followers around him who were fascinated by his presence. They followed him all over Galilee. They followed him to Jerusalem. And after his death, they followed him to Bethany to see him depart this world. While Jesus was among us, all eyes were on him, learning from him, being healed from him, being strengthened and called by him. But in this final passage of Luke, Christ opened up the Gospels to them and reminded them of the truth that he fulfilled all Scripture. He called them to witness to these things, and he charged them to proclaim the truth of these things and the truth of God's forgiveness of sins from Jerusalem to all the nations. And then he left. That is not coincidental. It was part of his charge, part of his sending, that he would leave. Because the focus was no longer on Christ. The people were not tied to one specific place, one specific person, to find inspiration and hope. Because Christ was no longer in bodily form, they were freed to begin from Jerusalem and spread the word farther out into the world, farther than any one human could. The presence of God in Jesus Christ was gone, but was soon to be replaced by the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. It's as though Christ was leaving to make space for the Holy Spirit, stepping aside to make way for the next step in God's process. God's presence transitioned from the incarnate embodied Jesus Christ to the infusive, intangible power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit empowered the people for the mission of the church to which Christ called them and drove the church out to live up to its calling. When I think about the parting of Jesus and the impact that goodbyes have on us, I cannot help but think of funerals. The moments when we say our final goodbyes. They're a chance to reflect on our experiences with a loved one and consider how their life has impacted ours. I am reminded of a sentiment which I have heard Elizabeth express a number of times in funeral sermons regarding how we might live differently as a result of having known or been changed by our loved ones. I think it speaks to what the disciples might have experienced as Christ left. Elizabeth speaks about the faithful and important things someone has done in their life, and then speaks the truth that we will honor that person's legacy by remembering them while we do those things. If she was a bastion of Southern hospitality, we honor her legacy when we welcome, care for, or host. If he gave of himself selflessly, we honor his legacy when we give of ourselves without expectation. By thinking of our lives this way, by considering how we honor those who have departed, we are connected to them. I imagine the disciples could have used those words of encouragement as much as we can. You honor Christ's legacy when you care for those who are in need, when you heal those who are sick, when you stand up for the downtrodden and loose the bonds of injustice, when you love your neighbor as yourself, and forsake the 99 sheep for the one who is lost. When you love with reckless abandon and give of yourself for the sake of others. These are the ways that we honor Christ's legacy. This story reminds us that Christ's mission in this world was to heal, to teach, to forgive, and then to turn our gaze outward to the world around us. To empower humans 
to experience the love of God and then turn that love to others. His calling to us is to see his path and pursue it and to never turn back no more. It was never just about being with Jesus or walking where he did or seeing what he saw. It has always been something more. It has always been about being empowered by who Jesus was and empowered by the presence of the Holy Spirit we have been, have been given to share the good news, to teach, to heal, to lift up. By doing these things, we fulfill that calling that we have been given. May we, honoring the legacy of Jesus Christ and empowered by the presence of the Holy Spirit, share God's love. Amen.